We are conditioned to use the attention of others as motivation. The reactions of others determine what is good and bad, and who is well-liked or not. Social conditioning is a powerful way to determine what is good and bad. Facebook is the ultimate comparison platform. All of the information about other users is available within a couple clicks. In minutes, an individual can find out all about another user's life, their hobbies, interests, relationship status, and appearance. Usually data is quantitative if it is a numerical value. And if it is not numerical, then it is classified as qualitative. Professionals argue over which is more significantly impactful. Facebook users see the lifestyles of their friends by looking at pictures and status updates, all of which are qualitative. However, Facebook provides yet another way for users to directly compare themselves to others. It is quantitative, harsh, non-arguable, and concrete. Likes. Looking at pictures on Facebook, users automatically make judgments. She is pretty. He is happy. She is rich. But very quickly, individuals use these pictures as a comparison. She is prettier than me. He is happier than me. She has more money than me. All of these perceptions are qualitative. In addition to these qualitative views, the user gets a quantitative score. Below the person's picture is the number of likes. The focus of the study is this. When the individual makes a qualitative judgment about another person, is their opinion influenced by a quantitative value as well? I am interested in studying internet users quantitative and qualitative comparisons on Facebook, specifically the correlations of likes and perceptions of happiness. Do the number of likes influence how users perceive other people's happiness? My hypothesis is that in the environment of Facebook, quantitative likes have an effect on the qualitative judgment of the perceived happiness of other individuals in the pictures, but only in female users. I performed a three-way and between-group study. Each study group had a corresponding questionnaire. All three questionnaires contained six pictures that were supposedly profile pictures of a fictional Facebook user. The participants then rated on a scale of 1, very low, to 10, very high, how happy they perceived the fictional user to be with his or her life based on the information shown in the profile picture. All six pictures were identical among the three questionnaires. The number of likes that the fictional user received on his or her profile differed between the surveys. 51 high school students between the ages of 16 and 18 volunteered for this study. 27 were male, 21 were female. Participants were each randomly given one of the questionnaire versions to answer. After rating six of the pictures, the participants then indicated whether they were male or female and if they had a Facebook account. When the participants were finished, they raised their hands and the experimenter collected their questionnaires from them. The experimenter repeated this process exactly in three other classrooms. This graph shows a general trend in the data from the survey answers. On the x-axis is the question number. On the y-axis is the average rating of perceived happiness. The control group is in blue. The survey with a high number of likes is in red. The survey with a low number of likes is shown in green. As you can see, there's a distinct trend in the data. However, I need to see if this trend is reliable and valid. First, Dr. Alan Mickelson of Whitworth University tested to see if the questions I wrote for the survey yielded valid results. I needed to see if the range of ratings that the participants gave remained consistent. There needs to be internal consistency within the question groups. So if, for example, there were three people in one group and they rated the picture, one person rated the picture a 1, the other person rated the picture a 2, but the third picture rated the picture a 10, the 10 would skew the data. The 10 is what is called an outlier. It would raise the average, indicating that the question was interpreted very differently. 
The Chrome box test calculated to make sure that there were no outliers that were skewing the data in my questions. In other words, it tested for internal consistency to make sure that the questions were actually asking about the variables in the study. As long as the number for the test is above 0.7, the data is internally consistent. As you can see, my results were 0.754, which is above the threshold and therefore valid. Once I knew that the questions I asked yielded valid results, I went on to actually test my hypothesis. I was looking for a statistical difference between the study groups. This difference is called variance. But I had to make sure that the difference between the groups was caused by the manipulated variable, likes. I had to make sure that the difference wasn't by accident. It wasn't by chance or random error. It had to be treatment, or likes, making the statistical difference. You introduce random errors simply by using a sample group because it is only a representative. F ratio indicates this calculation. If you take out the manipulated variable and just divide the first group's results by the second, it will be based on chance, and the answer will be close to 1. But once you introduce a treatment, which in our case is likes, it should widen the difference of the study groups beyond random error alone. Using this knowledge, Dr. Mickelson ran an ANOVA to test my hypothesis. As you can see, there is a very large F ratio between the survey groups, which is much greater than 1. However, when I tested for gender, the F ratio was only 0.862, which is less than 1. Therefore, the survey shows that there is a significant difference between the study groups but gender does not have an effect on the results. Gender is just by chance. The results will happen one-third of the time. However, the difference between the study groups is greater than chance, for the results will happen three in every thousand. The results of this concluded that there was some significant difference between the study groups. My next step was to identify where the significant difference lay. So Dr. Mickelson ran a post hoc test to identify which pairs of study groups had a significant difference. The test calculated that there was a significant difference in the means between Survey 3 and Survey 1 and between Survey 3 and Survey 2, but there is no significant difference between Survey 1 and Survey 2. Therefore, the control group, Survey 1, showed a significant between-group relationship with a survey group that had a low number of likes, Survey 3. Like I predicted in my hypothesis, in the environment of Facebook, quantitative data, likes, does have an effect on the qualitative judgment of the perceived happiness of other individuals in the pictures. Specifically, the low number of likes negatively affects the perceived happiness of the fictional Facebook user. However, gender does not influence these results. Both men and women participants are equally affected by the low number of likes. This study demonstrates the effect of upward comparisons. In my observation, I noticed that Facebook users tend to delete their statuses when they don't receive as many likes. This study may help explain why users tend to feel bad about their self-worth when they receive a low number of likes.